everybody. Welcome to our panel this afternoon, Music, Criminal Justice, and Racial Equality. It's an honor and a privilege uh, to see so many folks who are here with us today. I'm uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. It's my, it's, my, it's my honor to represent the 8th Congressional District in New York, otherwise known as the People's Republic of Brooklyn. Someone said to me the other day, one of my colleagues, he said, I can't, why do you always shout Brooklyn out? I said, that's how we do. Right. <laughs> but Show it's such up. an honor to represent my hometown in the United States Congress and Queens and to serve with so many other uh, distinguished elected officials, particularly those uh, who are members of the Congressional Black Caucus. We're thankful uh, that so many folks have come out uh, here today. I know enough to know we have a great panel uh, a great set of issues to discuss, a great turnout, standing room only, and I know y'all ain't here to see me. <laughs> but I did just want to frame the discussion and then I'm going to turn it over to our dynamic uh, moderator. Last year, uh, we did a panel on artists and activism. Uh, this year, we're focused on criminal justice equality and the role that musicians have historically played. Why did we take that approach. Because we concluded that we're in an all hands on deck moment, given what we face here in America. And when you track the African American journey, we've always been in a situation where there's been progress followed by backlash. Yep. Progress followed by backlash. We know this is a great country born of high ideals. Uh, but we also know that there was a birth defect, a genetic imperfection during the founding of the republic around the question of race manifesting itself initially in slavery, one of the worst crimes ever committed against humanity. But as a result of a whole lot of folks working through that challenge, we arrived at emancipation and then the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery, 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law, 15th Amendment, guaranteeing the right to vote regardless of race, the Reconstruction period from 1865 to 1878, progress. And then immediately, the North leaves the South. And what happens? Jim Crow descends. Plessy versus Ferguson. The KKK rises up. A lynching epidemic. Black codes put into place in the Jim Crow South and throughout the country. Progress followed by backlash. And then as a result of so many of the people upon whose shoulders we stand, there was another moment of progress. Brown v. Board of Education, Jackie Robinson, Rosa Parks, the civil rights leaders, Dr. King, the Big Six, leading to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. 1965 Voting Rights Act, 1968 Fair Housing Act, War on Poverty, Great Society, Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, Living Wage, all of that done, progress once more. And then in 1968, in April, King is assassinated. Later that summer, RFK is assassinated. And then in November, Richard Nixon is elected on a platform of appealing to racial anxiety as it relates to the progress that had been made. Sound familiar? Right. And then Nixon gets elected, anti-busing, anti-affirmative action, ushers in a new so-called conservative movement. And as relevant to what we're going to talk about here today, in 1971 announces the war on drugs by declaring drug abuse public enemy number one. In 1971, at that time, there were less than 350,000 people incarcerated in America. Today, more than 2.2 million. More people than any other country in the world, the majority of whom black and Latino, half of whom nonviolent drug offenders, progress followed by backlash that included the mass incarceration epidemic. 
and then bringing us to where we are today. In 2008, the great Barack Obama is elected. A phenomenal development for this country, and we're much better off today because of the eight years that he spent in this town. But consistent with the journey that we as African Americans have had in this country, every time there's progress, is followed by backlash. And the backlash moment that we found ourselves in initially manifested itself with the Tea Party so-called revolution. That's Article I in the House of Representatives in 2010. And then the Supreme Court strips away Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act that had been put into place in 1965. That's Article Three, the court system. And then it concludes with the election of the hater in chief. <laughs> Can I talk to y'all? The Sorry. Grand Wizard of 1600 Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. Someone who has never hesitated to fan the flames of racial hatred. I'm not trying to say that every American who voted for Donald Trump is a racist. I do know every racist in America voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> Progress followed by backlash. And when you're in a backlash moment, which we're in right now, it requires all hands on deck. Members of Congress, clergy, activists, our fraternities and our sororities, entertainers, athletes, and musicians, and of course, the public intellectuals that are on the stage right now. So I'm thankful for your presence. I'm thankful for them. Let me shout out uh, Congressman Dwight Evans from Philadelphia, otherwise known as the Illidale, who's in the building and represents our artists uh, here today. And with that, let me just turn it over uh, to this all-star panel, which is going to be led by none other than the dynamic documentarian, the activist, the social justice commentator, the criminal justice reform champion, uh, someone who never hesitates to speak truth to power. He's my good friend. I'm honored that he's here with us today to lead this panel. None other than Van Jones. Let me, um, I, I don't think we gave Hakeem Jeffries, but no, 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 I'm, wait, wait. <laughs> you guys know this brother from what you see him doing in public. I get a chance to see what he does behind the closed door. If you think Hakeem Jeffries is tough on television and tough on the stump, you should see this man behind the closed door with Republican leaders who don't understand when he walks in. <laughs> They understand when he walks out. And, and, no, no, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. This is the only brother on earth who could have possibly figured out a way to get through this House of Representatives, a prison reform bill that got 360 votes 100% of the Democratic leadership, this brother's so bad, he had Trump and Pelosi supporting his bill. Nobody messes with Hakeem Jeffries when it's time to fight for justice. And he's effective and he gets stuff done. He doesn't just talk. He doesn't just talk. He gets stuff done. And so when he asked me to be a part of the panel, I said, listen, you know, uh, you're my leader and teacher. I've been doing this stuff for 25 years. I've never seen anybody be effective on both sides. Doesn't bite his tongue and still is effective. And so we have an opportunity, I think, uh, you, and you can see the interest. Uh, if you record this for a podcast, there's uh, 7,000 people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> All of them ready. Um, but there would be. I mean, it's literally, it's, it's standing room only. Uh, this panel is a special panel for the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, we would literally try to get uh, the best people to help, because people in this room want to do stuff. They want to they make things happen. And so we want to get people who are doers as well as thinkers, as well as prominent folks. 
and um, I'm going to uh, introduce each one just so you know who we have here. Uh, they're going to say a few words just about why, why they decided to come, and then I got a bunch of questions for them so we can make sure we use our time well. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the good brother Meek Mill is here, and I'm so glad he's home and free. Home and free. Um, and to have the kind of platform that he has as one of the world's greatest musicians and to be mistreated and then to come out a lot of people, when they come out, they come out and they hug their mama and they hug their girlfriend and they go on. He has come out fighting for justice. We got Meek Mill as a foremost champion out for justice. Glad to have him here. Um, we also, you know, the, the sisters have been uh, in the forefront, the background, and all around this fight for justice for generations and for centuries. And one of the foremost scholars of black women, black history, black music, and its intersection with social activism is here, Professor Michelle Scott. Give her a round of applause. Um, this is the, has forgotten more about justice than most of us are ever going to know. Uh, she's going to help us. And then there's a, a shy retiring, uh, a very soft-spoken, under-accomplished new scholar that we have high hopes for. No. Uh, you know, my father taught me growing up, excellence is a weapon. Excellence is a weapon against racism. And when you have somebody who has a mind like this brother, who has produced not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not 19 books, each one of them, a testament to black genius and, and black accomplishment and black commitment to justice, who then doesn't hide out on the campuses, but goes on television and will out debate and outbox anybody. We are honored to have on this stage the good brother, Michael Eric Dyson. And then also, you know, behind the scenes in the entertainment industry, in the business, uh, we have to have allies and champions. You know, it's one thing to be a star, it's something else to own the studio. You see, it's one thing to be an artist, that's critical, but artists have to deal with the so-called suits. And when the suits are wrong, you can't do very much. But when you have somebody who's served in government, somebody who's served uh, on, on boards of, of, of corporations and colleges, and who is inside the music industry who cares about justice, you have uh, something we haven't had for a long time. The brother uh, Jeffrey Harlston is here. Give him a round of applause from Universal. <laughs> Universal, not against us, with us. With us in this fight. So I want to start out with, with Meek. Uh, uh, Meek, everybody knows the story. Young man, did a little something silly. Did a little bit of time, then they kept you on probation forever. Every time you sneeze wrong, they try to throw you back in. Um, tell us what you learned this last time that you went in and why you have come out and now as such a strong champion. Uh, just addressing it from the beginning. Is this on? Yeah, y'all can hear me? Uh, just, just addressing things from the beginning. Uh, I come from North Philadelphia. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever been to North Philadelphia, but uh, <laughs> Uh, I grew up kind of in a rough environment, and the environment I grew up in, you know, we've seen uh, a lot of things. We've seen a lot of people strung out on drugs. We've seen a lot of violence. We've seen a lot of people killed in our lives. And, you know, we grew up in, in like, a, a survival mode when you grew up in an a area where you see a lot of death, and, you know, you see a lot of violence. And, you know, actually, uh, I was hanging in the wrong areas, and I, I got caught up at, in the system at the age of 19. At the age of 19, uh, I was a popular rapper in my community, and I was uh, had a few mixtapes out, and I was making a few dollars for myself, and started doing good by the age of 21. By the age of 22, I actually struck a record deal with Rick Ross, and uh, I'm 31 years old now, and I've never been back to prison for criminal activity, and through the years of 19 and 31, uh, I was sent back to prison, I think, three times. Uh, one time, actually, was for coming to D.C. Uh, Stayed like in a Virginia hotel or a Maryland hotel and uh, I didn't fill my travel out right. I was violated, I was sent back to prison. Uh, at one time, 
I was sent to prison for an uh, opioid addiction. I got addicted to taking Percocets. And, you know, every time I used to see my probation officer, she used to ask me, but, you know, it was an addiction. And I was, I, I wanted to hide the addiction. I, I wasn't actually being open with sharing my addiction. And, you know, uh, anytime I had a dir dirty yarn, I was sent to prison. And this last time, actually just seeing the support of the people uh, stand on my side because I come from like a small ho household, a single mother household. We never really had like a lot of support. So, you know, seeing the people support me the way they supported me and being on that side of the fence where, you know, I seen a lot of other young men in prison just for like small technical violations. I don't know if people know what a technical violation is. You don't have to commit crime, actual crime to go to prison for years at a time. And, you know, me seeing that and, and getting the support from people, I, I just thought when I get out, I felt like I owe a part of my platform to uh, help change the world and, you know, help change some of these things and bring light uh, to these situations. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, we're going to come back and talk about some of the great stuff that, that you've been doing. You ain't been home, but a minute, and you're already trying to change laws. So we're going to talk about that. Um, I want to also now uh, bring you to the forefront, uh, Dr. Scott. Um, and as you introduce yourself, just one thing, uh, I think the role of women and women artists is something that we don't talk enough about in the struggle. I know you're the world's expert on that, so we'll say whatever you want to say, but, but def definitely, uh, uh, if you could bring that into the conversation, I think that's going to be powerful. So I'm born and raised in Oakland, and so I have family members who are both in and out. Of can you hear? Just assistant. can you hear me? Don't is it on? Better? Hello? Better? All right, yeah. I can hear myself, so I can continue hearing me. You got to eat it. Like, <laughs> go, go, go close. I'm born and raised in Oakland, and my experiences with the criminal justice system come from having family members both in and out on both sides of, of the justice system. Um, my interest in black history came from my grandparents, from people who are actually part of the civil rights movement, although they're not named members of the civil rights movement, and namely my grandmothers. So they were strong black women who told me the roles that were missing from the history books. Like, you know, you see your average textbook and women are maybe marginalized on the side. And if you're talking about black history, they may be non-existent. And so wanting to know more about my own history, my own culture led me to go into studying history in college and in graduate school and really trying to fill in the gaps. And I study um, blues women, jazz women, uh, people like Bessie Smith, people like Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughn. And I try to talk about how a average everyday culture talks about or give vo gives voices to the voiceless. So my students, for example, are not going to necessarily know about lynching in the 1930s. But if I play them Strange Fruit and show them pictures of Billie Holiday, mm -hmm. they can make a recognition. Mm -hmm. They can see that same connection between um, someone singing Strange Fruit and Beyonce singing Freedom with Kendrick Lamar. And so trying to make that connection and also try to recapture the history and recapture the voices of black women has been part of my, my struggle, but also my passion and, and part of my life's work. Yeah, thank you. That's beautiful work, beautiful work. Give a round of applause. Y'all act like... Brother Dyson, I've been to a lot of conferences. I don't usually hear the connection between uh, Bessie Smith and Beyonce. So, so I mean, that's, and that's, that's why this panel is going to be so, so powerful and so important. Um, I, I, you could be the panel, and we, we could just sit here and listen to you. So, um, uh, but be, whatever you say, the one question I've been meaning to ask you and haven't asked you in all our conversations on and off the air is about Tupac. You've written so beautifully about him, so powerfully about him. And as you explain to us why you came here and why this topic of criminal justice is important to you, if you can just include any reference at all to Pac, um, and, uh, and how, wait, what would Pac be saying about the stuff we're seeing today? Yes, sir. Van Jones is an American original, isn't he? He's an American original. I begin there because Hakeem Jeffries, one of the most brilliant and gifted legislators we have in the nation today, and Van Jones, one of the most powerful, brilliant, and courageous public intellectuals on the front line in the midst of the crackerocracy, <laughs> fighting battles in a serious fashion. 
I used to pray for times like this to rhyme like this. So I had to grind like that to shine like this. <laughs> for all the things he can be celebrated for, having the maturity of black masculinity to squash the beef with Drake. Yeah. Huh? And I see Drake in the audience right here today. Thank you, Drake, for coming out, sir. <laughs> stand up, stand up, Drake. Stand up so they can see. Stand up, Drake. <laughs> thing last night too. So what's interesting, when we have a highly gifted entertainer like Meek Mill from Philadelphia, mm. Philadelphia now, serving time, as Jay-Z said, all these years later for what he did as a young person. Listen, do not miss what he said. Opioid addiction. Yeah. But he's in prison, he's in jail. The masses of young white people who are now opioid addicted are receiving, according to the orange apparition, help and support from the state while black folk get sent to jail. They get medicalized, we get criminalized. And I will say this, the reason I mean, I got a brother been in the Stone Hotel for 29 years, accused of murder, Right? He, slung, he slung drugs in Detroit. He was not a choir boy. I believe he's innocent, but I understand he got sent to jail for that crime. I know people who were on tape committing murder got out in 10 years. So I know at the same time from both ends to be both a victim of the vicious atrocities that we perpetrate against each other and a victim of a system that refuses to acknowledge the fundamental humanity of black and brown people in American society. So I'll say this, Tupac, Tupac said, somebody wake me, I'm dreaming. I started as a seed to semen, swimming upstream, planted in the womb while screaming. On the top was my pops, my mama hollering, stop from a single drop. This is what they got? Not to disrespect my people, but my papa was a loser. Only plan he had for mama was the blanker and abuser. And even as a seed, I could see his plan for me, stranded on welfare, another broken family. Juxtaposed, and I'll end here to him saying this. Just the other day, I got lynched by some crooked cops. And to this day, them same cops on the beat getting major pay. But when I get my check, they taking tax out, so we paying the cops to knock the blacks out. What Tupac understood is that even any time you are a paying American citizen, you are subsidizing your own oppression, if you fail to hold accountable the forces of the state that argue against us. That doesn't mean as I am. We know that there are good cops out here trying to do the right thing. Black folk call cops more than anybody else in America. On your mama. <laughs> but the reality is, we know the difference between law enforcement aiming to edifyingly engage with us as members of the state and those who demonize us because they have a corrupt conception of our fundamental dignity and humanity. Tupac died 22 years ago, but his voice continues to resonate in American society and reverberate in the halls of our collective consciousness. And that's why I'm here today to celebrate that genius, but to articulate the central proposition of justice in America, which we need today more than ever before. Well, and um, uh, thank you very much. And. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I, I wanted to say to Jeffrey Halston, I'm so sorry, I didn't, uh, <laughs> if I had thought this out more, if I had thought this out more clearly, I would have let him go last. Um, uh, but the rest of us will have to do the best that we can. Um, <laughs> I, um, I do, I do want to uh, say before I bring on, bring on, sir, is that, um, some of you guys may have missed one of the references. But for Meek Mill and Drake to squash the beef publicly, 
the first time these two brothers laid hands on each other was to shake hands and hug and give a pound. Understand what that means. That means for all of us who work with our young people, they printed a license for us to go out and say, why don't you do a Meek and Drake? Why don't you do a Meek and Drake? Why don't you do a Meek and Drake? And in three syllables, we now have a license to go out and fight for peace in our own community because this brother has been willing to do things, admit to addiction publicly. That frees a lot of people. Come out of prison and fight for prison reform. That frees a lot of people. And then shake hands with somebody who he's been beefing with all these years, never let it get it past words. Rat battling. What, what? Rat battling, not beef. Yeah, that's no, right. <laughs> no, no violence. But end it. <laughs> Keep it straight. Keep it straight. But when, I just want to say this. When, when black men do beautiful stuff, can black men get some love for doing beautiful stuff? Can black men get some love for doing beautiful stuff and being beautiful people? Is that all right? So, anyway, I just, I just, I just had, to, had to say that. And, 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 and uh, I thank you for correcting my uh, uh, misstatement. Um, Jeffrey Halston. You've served in government, you've served on boards at the highest level, you're in the industry. Help us understand, as more of these young artists are getting so-called woke, getting so-called conscious, wanting to step out, uh, how do you see the role of music and musicians and art in our struggle for justice from your position? Uh, well, first of all, can you all hear me? So, it's interesting you use the term woke because it's really what we've seen in the last, I've been in the music business for over 25 years, and artists have always been expressive in their music. But what we've seen really in the last 10 years, well, no, longer than that, 20 to 30 years, we've seen a different type of expression. And I think a lot of it comes from the growth and emergence of hip hop. Because hip hop is a different type of medium Hip hop is urgent, and hip hop is angry, and hip hop is almost definitionally confrontational and proud at the same time. And what we're finding is artists are, are woke. They are coming into their own, and they're expressing it in lyrics, like Dr. Dyson was, was reciting from Tupac. You know, you go back, you look at the Public Enemy records from the early 90s. I mean, these are artists that were stepping out and making a statement probably putting themselves at risk for their careers and what they, could, what they could achieve commercially. But what we're seeing now is in addition to the lyrical expression, you're also finding artists taking their celebrity and using that, whether it's Beyonce using the Super Bowl platform to make a statement with Formation, or whether it's Meek stepping out and doing what he's doing now, putting his, you know, this is a guy who's sitting here bearing his life for all of you to tell, to explain his story, to make it better for others. And we're seeing that more and more often with artists that are, that are coming on. And, it's, and it is really in the hip hop genre. There's always been artistry across genres that has been, that has been very expressive. You know, bands like U2 have been uh, very expressive. That, that's there. But what we're seeing in, in the modern age artists today is a willingness to stand up, use the celebrity, use social media, use what they have. Not only, the, the, you know, the, they're, it's in the music, but taking it beyond the music. Uh, that, that, that was a mic drop, lights yeah, out moment. Right, right. I don't know. Nobody <laughs> 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 oh, 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 do that. Um, uh, let me stay with you for one second, though. So, at, at Universal specifically, what are some of the things that you're doing there that, that you see to support and to further the, the voice of people who may not have a voice otherwise, except through through the art? Yeah. So, so I work at Universal Music Group, and just to give you guys perspective. We, we have, have labels that range from Motown, the legendary Motown, to uh, uh, labels like Priority Records, Aftermath, Cash Money, Quality Control. So we're, we're in urban music heavy. And what we have to do first and foremost is, is make an environment where artists feel comfortable coming forward and speaking their mind. And then 
once we do that, we have to take situations where, let's use Kendrick Lamar, for example. You know, some people would look at Kendrick at first, look, first pass and might think, that's not the most commercial exercise, but that's not what it's about. The, the, the artist is incredible in terms of what he says. He's incredible in terms of how he expresses it. And so it's, you know, what we've done is we've made a commitment to make sure that he has the, pla the biggest platform he possibly can to express himself, irrespective of what a radio station says they want to play or don't play, because we've had that battle for years, um, to television programs that may not want to book him. We've had that battle for years. You know, this year we got him on the halftime of the NCAA championship game. Mm -hmm. That's never happened before. Right. So, so we're committed to trying to find opportunities for these artists to get the biggest platform they possibly can to express themselves. Beautiful, beautiful. Dr. Scott, um, you know, he's fighting to get more platforms for more people. Uh, looking back, when has an artist getting a platform for a musical performance had an impact in history? Well... I think to even kind of echo back why he's saying that hip hop is leading the way, that it's because hip hop is based on a blues music foundation. And that blues musicians were speaking their truth as soon as they started to record. And some of the early um, recording artists were women coming out in the 1920s. And so you had Bessie Smith singing of things like jailhouse blues as early as 1923, talking about places like Black Mountain Blues where all the birds sing bass and about the poverty and the degradation of where she's living and where she's coming from. And so you see moments like this where artists are building on their everyday lives and trying to communicate that to a larger audience through their music. Um, some moments to me that really trigger um, spaces where music becomes important were even in the first writing, the first singing of Lift Every Voice and Sing in 1900, singing for an audience for Booker T. Washington um, in February of 1900, and really giving black people a voice where they hadn't had one before a way to communicate their pain, their anguish, their struggle, but also their willingness to stand up and fight for what they believe in, their connections to home, their connections to motherland in Africa, and continuing on that legacy of giving themselves that you know, national anthem when they weren't given a nation. Um, from then on, looking at that early period in 1900, I really see something that communicates with um, everyday folks was Watts Dex in 1972 the seventh uh, anniversary of the commemoration of the Watts riots, um, where you have a sold out stadium um, where people are paying $1 a ticket um, and people like Rufus Thomas, uh, like the legendary Isaac Hayes, the staple singers singing about respect yourself um, and really totally exhibiting what they call cultural nationalism in the forefront, telling people of the world, here we are. We're reclaiming our city from violence from police brutality, and we're gonna sing about it and be proud in our blackness. So I really see that there's like a legacy of these moments where music are, comes to the center and the forefront. Um, you skipped over uh, Marian Anderson. Yes. Talk, talk about, I don't think people understand the significance of her performance in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And I, 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 you've written about it and spoken about it before. Just tell people that story. Um, Mary An Anderson, the legendary contralto, um, born and raised in Philadelphia, um, sh her concert at the Lincoln Memorial really engages um, the classic civil rights movement. So in 1939, she is denied access um, to sing at Constitution Hall by the Daughters of the American Revolution, um, which leads to a whole local um, DC outreach movement to figure out, well, where is she going to sing? Um, this is while issues of uh, segregation are being negotiated, but the contract at the Constitution Hall clearly says that Negroes are not allowed. Um, through the grassroots activism of men and women in DC, meeting in schools, meeting in churches, they managed to negotiate her performance in 1939 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, which for the DAR brings an audience that would have been closed and just local issue to now the world is listening to her sing, My Country, Tis of Thee. It's one of the first recorded concerts that we see before the March on Washington that really brings DC into um, the forefront. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I, it, it's so powerful what an artist can do uh, on the microphone, supported by uh, a record label sometimes, sometimes having to fight against a record label to do it. Um, but you know, Meek, you're in a position where some of the things that you're saying and doing not on the microphone, 
are we going to have an impact? Can you let people know some of the laws you're trying to change and, and some, just some of the, the actual substantive policy stuff that you're starting to engage with? Uh, one of the policies we were trying to work on in Pennsylvania where, uh, where people don't get put on probation for 10 years. Uh, uh, we were trying to work on like a probation cap. We don't know if it would be five years or three years related to whatever type of offense you have. But <clears throat> me, myself, I was sentenced to 10 years of probation. Uh, like I said, through the opioid uh, addiction, I probably failed the test three times. And within them three times, my probation was extended to 16 years, which extended to me going back to prison to t for uh, two to four years for uh, being arrested in New York City for popping a willy. And you know- Wait, wait, what, what, what horrific crime did you commit in New York City? I uh, popped a willy, I switched the gear. And you uh, popped the wheelie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I popped the willy. And um, like literally, like a wheelie, like a like a wheelie. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but it really extended. It, it extended from uh, the judge that oversees my case. She kind of looked at it as if uh, I had three dirty yarns, uh, popped a wheelie. Uh, I traveled across state lines, and, and her mind and the way the narrative, the way she said it in the courtroom, as if. I was just felling over and over again. And, and in my mind, I always looked at it like, yeah, I made some mistakes. Uh, I made a mistake by uh, being getting addicted to opioids. Actually, I've been loving uh, motorcycles and dirt bikes since I was a kid. If anybody follows me, they know that's like my first love even before rap. I've been wheeling and riding bikes my whole life. And I believe I made some mistakes, but I never thought I would be put in a state penitentiary with people that got life sentences because I popped the willy. I, I thought the farthest that could go was probably a traffic ticket, which I would have gladly paid. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, things got deeper. And you know, just even me, uh, I'm doing a, a, a kind, kind of okay for myself, which I, I, I got a career, I got a future. And even with me having a future, this probation has been trailing me so long that if I did one thing wrong, even at this point I'm at in my life right now, uh, the way the narrative was set through me going to prison three, four times, the world and America know me for going to prison. Like me dealing with companies, me dealing with business, I'm known for going to prison, but I'm not known for going to prison for crime. And you know what I'm saying? That already set the narrative for people like me. And you got young men coming up who uh, have felonies on their records, who can't get a job, who are always looked at as criminals stuff on probation and we trying to uh, work on just getting a cap on it because in Pennsylvania we don't have a cap and anytime you commit a technical violation years and years and years and years could be added on your probation and if you got 16 years of probation the law is if you get a technical violation you could get them 16 years gave to you in jail time so you know uh, we just working on trying to change them policies first. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. When you hear him describing just his, his, his journey, here's somebody, he was literally not committed a crime since he was a teenager. Now in his 30s, they just keep stretching the probation out so then anytime he does anything, they can throw him back in prison. I mean, how does this, how does this fit into the long struggle for justice and freedom for, for African Americans? What's on your mind, Professor? Yes, sir. I mean, it's, it's astonishing, as it should be to everybody here. I've been an ordained Baptist minister for nearly 40 years. And the fight I see Reverend Raphael Warnock here of Ebenezer Baptist Church, Reverend Marcia Dyson, social justice activist in the back of the room. And what my religion tells me, religion from the word legare, to bind together, is that this is how we divide one from the other. And the division ain't arbitrary. It ain't no mistake. It's deliberate. Look at this young man, mm. highly articulate, mm. extremely handsome, yes. self-possessed. He's like my son. I mean, good looking boy, good looking boy. Uh, that's charming chocolate over there. <laughs> so how you gonna have a good looking, highly intelligent, articulate young man who's a businessman, who's an entrepreneur, who's trying to help other people out of the cesspool and the pitholes of America, those urban enclaves of civic terror we call ghettos and slums, here he is as an ambassador for goodwill. 
trying to build a bridge between his conscience and their redemption. Being subject to a criminal justice system that lets a man who stands up every day to excrete the feces of his moral depravity into a nation he has turned into a psychic commode and call him president, <laughs> who, who is motivated by mercurial appetites and deeply and profoundly pathological instincts. Here we have black people who from day one have been criminalized, popping a willy enjoying things that young white kids do on the regular, every day. Look, I teach at Georgetown. I don't want to out my own school. A few years back, they had kids who were caught on a meth lab. And they got busted because they were using credit cards. Now, my first advice to them was, never put your drugs on credit cards. <laughs> yes. I'm just your consigliere. <laughs> Like the Godfather, look how they massacred my boy. So, so the thing is, don't be stupid about it. But look at this. Did they go to jail? No. But those in a crack house, the, the geopolitical destiny of black people is tied up with where we do our crime, where we do our living. It's not a crime to pop a willy. It's not a crime to be black, but it's been criminalized. If Meek Mill is continuing to confront the haunting specter of the criminal justice system, it is because black people have been haunted from the very beginning. When they had police dogs sent after us when we escaped from enslavement. When they had people during Jim Crow, do you know? Here they are mad at Colin Kaepernick. They hung black men for having the unabashed temerity and the gall to wear their uniforms back when they were after they were involved in the war and because they were American heroes and patriots, people lynched them because they hated the fact that they embraced that uniform. From the very beginning in this country as I am, from the very beginning, black people have been haunted by a criminal injustice system. Read the Declaration of Independence, written by a man who was the architect of Monticello, who was the Secretary of State, who hung out in Paris, who became president of the United States of America and wrote some of the greatest literature ever in the history of this country, but also in the Declaration of Independence talked about native peoples and black people as unreliable citizens in this northern hemisphere and American culture. So from the very beginning, the law has been disposed against us to demonize us, to tyrannize us. Now look what they're doing to a young man down in Dallas because he has some weed. They trying to act like right now he deserved to die from a police woman who rode up in his crib and shot him in his own home. So I'm saying this, we must, as Van Jones, as Hakeem Jeffries, as all of these great panelists here meet, what we must do is leverage the authority of our voting, of our millennial opposition, of our voices being raised, and guess what, if they go throw somebody in jail, Thomas Jefferson had sex with a 14-year-old girl. It didn't start with R. Kelly. That was a lot more than popping a willy, right? So my point is that if we have forgiven the great sins of great men, because of patriarchy and white supremacy, this criminal justice system must be turned around so that thriving, intelligent young men and women like this man right here will rise up to become our leaders and continue to express our deepest interest in justice in America. You know, um, Meek, one of the things that we've talked about is that you know you do have a lot of support yeah. um, and one of the things I thought was really extraordinary was that um, you know, people came to see you in prison from high places yeah. and they were shocked by what they saw they don't know right. Right. honestly what we go through can you talk a little bit about the impact of your case on some of the people who maybe didn't even know what was going on who now have become more passionate? 
Um, you know, just, I felt like sometimes it took people like to come from higher places and come see me for people to like view the situation different. Even when I was arrested, like it was like certain officials that worked at uh, the prison, they were like, who does God think he is? Or what do you, what do you think he's special? I'm like, right. I don't think I'm special. I don't even want to be here, you know what I'm saying? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anything extra here. I just want to go home. <laughs> and you know, um, it was one guy, and, and, and this, just, this is an example. It was one guy, like, he just always used to talk bad. He was like an official CEO, and then like, Kevin Hart, my friend Michael Rubin came to see me, and then he was like, wow. I should, I gotta open my eye up to this now. And I'm like, why does it take a celebrity right. and a guy that's a billionaire to come visit me for you to open your eyes? You know what I'm saying? Mm. And me, I, I don't judge people because I don't know anybody's story. I don't know anybody's decisions right. they made in their life. Right. And you know, I just thought uh, when I got out, I'm gonna speak for the voice. Like you said, the voice of the voiceless, the yeah. people who don't have somebody to speak up for them. Like I seen one of the questions where they said like, what would you say to the people trapped behind a wall that don't have a platform like you? I say nothing to them. I say something to the people on the other side of the wall mm. for us to bring light and support mm. the ones that are caught up in the system. Right. The land of the Man. <laughs> <laughs> just let that just sit for a second. Right, right. And two, like I don't, I don't like come into these type of situations like laying myself out as like an angel. I don't commit crime. Uh, I actually, uh, I employ a lot of young black men. Uh, I do a lot of community service in my neighborhood. I don't attach myself to stupid things, but you know, uh, through life, I've been through things in life which uh, a lot of people in this room probably been through. And you know, the way they set it up for me, like. Now it's to the point, if you make the smallest mistake in the world, it's like, you're an asshole, uh, you, you, you're, you're a mess up, basically. And, you know, uh, I walk a straight line, and, you know, I, 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 I got to live looking over my back left and right, because even doing things like this, you have authorities in areas where I'm from that are even angered even more right. that I'm reaching back to try to even help right. fix these type right. problems. So, you know, uh, I just call it, People always say, I'm sorry for what you had to go through. That six months was bad, but uh, it turned out to be a blessing, you know what I'm saying? And mm. I take it as a blessing, and that's the way we're going to carry it. And, you know, I'm going to use my platform, continue to use my platform to try to make a difference. Mm. Right. Uh, beautiful. Thank you. Um, I, I really don't, I, I, I talk for a living. I don't. I'd be nervous to talk and stuff like this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Under arm <own> sweat. <laughs> now, You're beautiful, man. Yeah. You know, it's, it, he really is nervous when he first started talking. His leg was vibrating so much, it was shaking up here, and I had to hold the mic. I'm not joking. I mean, he's a sincere brother. I mean, he was nervous. His legs was vibrating. I was having to hold the mic because it was banging. And, um, but I'm just saying, like, we need to support our young sisters and brothers when they step up yes. and when they do this. Because there are people who would love for him to, to, to throw a candy wrapper on their ground so they can put him back in prison. Trust me. Right, right. Trust me. They don't want this. Right. And um, I don't even want to add anything to what you said because it's just, I mean, you can see the effect. Uh, <clears throat> Congressman, I'm a, I know you're not supposed to talk. You're trying to rest your voice for later on or whatever. But we, will you please just respond a little bit to what you've heard? Don't be mad at me. I just, I, I got nothing else to say. I can't, I, I, nobody else can say anything. So we turn to our hero. Well, I think one of the reasons why we wanted to put, you know, this panel together uh, is that we wanted to make it clear that the contemporary experience that Meek is going through really chase, traces itself back to the origins and foundations of this country. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we don't put that in context, uh, then we're not gonna really be able to navigate how we move forward in the most thoughtful, effective, uh, and powerful way. Uh, and I think that in doing so, the hope really uh, is that you're inspired both 
by Meek's sincerity, intelligence, authenticity mm -hmm. in telling his story and the context that is put in by these two brilliant public intellectuals. Uh, and all of us uh, really, as I mentioned at the outset, have this all hands on deck responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so the hope is, uh, as we continue this discussion, uh, that you leave inspired uh, to participate in this democracy, to be active, to make a difference, and to help turn this thing around. Because that's what those who have come before us have consistently done, uh, and that's what we'll need to do Let me uh, ask as we you. transition. Let me, I mean, we've, got, we've got to transition to the question and answer, whatever, which is probably why most of y'all are here. But you don't have to do this, Congressman. I mean, you really, I mean, you're, you, I mean, everybody's talking about someday you're going to be governor, someday you're going to be president, someday you're going to be, I mean, like, everybody's, like, so excited about you because you don't just talk, you're also effective. It's easy to get up and give speeches. It's also easy to, sometimes easy to pass bills if you have no principles. You have principles, you're a beautiful speaker, and you get stuff done. But, I mean, this is a, if, this is a hard topic. This is not an easy topic. We get it. People here get it. A lot of people still don't get it. Why don't you champion, you know, going to Mars or you know something that, you know, other people might understand better? Why, why are you doing this? Well, a few reasons, but let me acknowledge uh, one: the presence of another social justice champion, uh, my colleague from the great state of New Jersey, Congresswoman Bonnie Watson. Bonnie at a recent hearing uh, between oversight and judiciary. Bonnie Watson keeps it real. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're thankful for her. But that's really yes. the tradition uh, that the Congressional Black Caucus uh, comes out of. And I'm proud, you know, to stand on the shoulders uh, of the Honorable Shirley Chisholm, yes. which is a district that I currently represent in part. Yeah. And, and it was 50 years ago. Uh, this year that Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman ever elected to the United States Congress. Mm. Unbought and unbought. And if we've got this system of oppression that we're pushing against, the brilliance of America and the oppression uh, in America, it's going to take... Uh, but I don't want to hear that. Why are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I grew up... I grew up in central Brooklyn in the middle of the crack cocaine epidemic. Talk about that. Bro. And, you know, there were a lot of folks, brilliant individuals, caught up uh, in the drug trade, but criminalized in a way, 100 to 1 for crack cocaine, uh, one in mm -hmm. terms of the sentence for powder cocaine, criminalized in a way that other communities weren't being criminalized. That's right. And it seemed to me, uh, that the basic injustice of it all needed to be confronted. And if it's happening in New York City, which is the you know, progressive capital of the world in many ways, and to this day, the marijuana arrest capital of the world. Personally, I think we gotta legalize marijuana uh, because it's being used as a weapon against us. And you know, the, the in-your-face injustice of the war on drugs currently as laid out with Meek's own story in terms of how he was treated because of opioid addiction right. and how others are coddled in the mountains of West Virginia and Appalachia and other parts of the country requires urgent action. And in New York City, uh, you've got a widely acknowledged fact that white folks use marijuana at the same if not higher rates than black and Latino folks. But more than 80% of the simple possession arrests for marijuana in New York City are of young black and Latino men. Now how can it be that if you're on the Upper East Side or the Upper West Side or in the Village or in Williamsburg or other hippie gentrifying parts of New York, smoking marijuana is socially acceptable behavior and in Bed-Stuy or East New York or Harlem or the South Bronx is subject to criminalization. Mm -hmm. That's a simple standard where the dividing line is race. That's a manifestation 
uh, as Michelle Alexander said, of the new Jim Crow, yes. and it requires urgent action and response. Look, we have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. We're going to probably get about three or four questions in. I promise Akeem Jeffers I wasn't going to ask him a question, but I just, I'm fascinated by this brother. I know so many Congress people who duck these issues, and he's always stepping up to the plate. I love it, I love it, I love it. Who wants to ask a question? <laughs> Give her a mic. Uh, yes? Okay, now a question has a question mark at the end. It is one sentence. It is one sentence. Go ahead. All right, and everybody's not going to get in just because we don't have the time, but go ahead. All right. So we'll, we'll, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get three questions in a row. Don't answer. Somebody write down. If you want to answer that one, write it down. Somebody, so that way we can get more questions and we can answer a little bit more in bulk. Okay. All right, so, so you go first. So, all right, my name is Joe McNally. I'm the author of this book, The Here in the Helmet, Colin Kaepernick. So in regards to this book and um, Meek, I'd like for you to answer, and anyone on the panel for them to answer. So in regards to when you think about like football, right? So in, in a lot of ways, prison reform or prison has a lot to do with race, right? With the disparities of that. Well, so when you think about football, for example, 90% of the players are black athletes, or sports in general, or, or rap or whatever, where everybody wants to be black. The co I, you know, what, what do you think from your perspective is the hesitation that comes with other celebrities rallying up together and saying, like, or you know, speaking up, like you're, like you're doing, you're taking a stand and using your platform. What do you think the hesitation is with other celebrities doing that? Because from my perspective, if, if all, if all the players say I'm not playing football, like what can you really do? Yeah, when we do that. So like, what, what yeah, do you think? So let's just hold on. We're gonna get three in a row. Oh. So that, that way we can get more questions. The, the, there's a question about why don't more athletes, why don't the athletes take some similar stance to, to Kaepernick no, and to me? Second question. Good afternoon, beautiful people. My name is Gandhi. I'm from the Bahamas. It's my first caucus and definitely not my last. But um, when we talk about when we talk about music and the criminal justice and racial equality, I know Mr. Halson, you spoke about all of the record labels, and me, you are a rapper. Um, what about putting our message in the music? You're talking about strange fruit and we know about our history. What about a group of people getting together, putting that deep, deep message in the music, talking about how we can solve these problems and the record labels actually letting them be their true, authentic black selves okay. so that we can continue to, I guess, perpetuate our message. So, so what if we had a, a new black, we are the world type of thing? Uh, well, so that's, that's a question. Hello everyone, my name is DeMarquin Johnson. I'm a graduate of Howard University. Hey, and I'm currently a student at Harvard Law School and Harvard Kennedy School. All right. I'm focusing, on, I'm focusing my research on reentry programs and I'm interested in knowing your thoughts on how do we eliminate and what type of programs we can use, whether it be the laws, community initiatives, on eliminating the stigma and the discrimination that formerly incarcerated people face. Thank you. Good, all right, um, so that's, that's three. Uh, why don't we take those three? Um, Meek, you wanna go first? Uh, so our first question is, I would say uh, a lot of artists and the people that people support and believe in don't actually have the heart to make the sacrifice for their own people, that's uh, number one. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> that was straightforward. Yeah, uh, I actually got a song talking about, about Colin Kaepernick where I say, uh, they told Cap, stand up, you wanna play for a team. And most of his teammates ain't saying the thing. They woke. If you don't stand for something, you gonna fall for nothing. I said, in the 30s, you'll be killed if you, I said, back in the 30s, you will be killed if you kneel. But they don't kill you now. They just take you out of your deal, kill your account, look where money gets spilled. Basically saying like, mm, they won't lynch him by hanging him by a tree. They'll lynch his bank account. You know wow. What I'm saying? And wow. lynch him, and try to lynch his platform. And uh, Cap is doing very well for itself. I support Kaepernick 1,000%. But, you know, in this game, a lot of things, a lot of people that, uh, that we champion don't have the same beliefs in us and not willing to make the same sacrifice that uh, Colin Kaepernick made. You know what? Right. We can't uh, it. Very, very good. Um, Jeff, can we, can we have a, a, a black We Are The World? <laughs> We'd love that. We'd love to have a black We Are The World. Um, and and uh, just responding to the woman who spoke, you know, it's, it's 
certainly, I think, you know, I can speak for my company. I'm sure other companies are, are very similar. We want artists to be their true, authentic self. Um, and, you know, uh, you may be familiar, you know, Nas had a record, in fact, that was, you, you know, yes, we can. So, you know, that, that's, that's, that's not something that's, that nobody wants. I will say this, though. We, get, we have to look beyond, I mean, something that really touches on what Meek said in terms of getting artists to stand up and speak, it's a very courageous effort because there is an economic side to it. As the, just earlier this year, there was a, a digital platform that took the position that with respect to certain artists, not their music, but what was happening or alleged to have happened in their personal lives, that they were going to actually not promote their music on their platform. I'm not saying any names, but I'll just say this. You know, you know, subsequently, there was a backlash, thank God, and that's gone away. But these are the kinds of things that are real. It's, real, it's really out there. Um, so it is hard for, for, you know, not every artist is willing to, to be as courageous and come out and say what they want. But if they are willing to, please come forward, because we will make that record. Wow, that's good. Can I, can I, just, can I just very briefly? But the thing is, you gotta support that kind of music, not just talk about you want it, right? Right. right? It ain't like, it ain't like uh, you know, if Jay is talking about a lot of stuff, but Jay's also said, uh, you know, that, that he's all the, and all my teachers couldn't reach me, and my mama couldn't beat me hard enough to match the pain of my pop not seeing me so with that disdain in my membrane. He talks about that. Back then, back when, the police was Al-Qaeda, the black men. So it sprinkled throughout the music, mm. but what they understood is you got to get them in the seats first and make their butts groove, and then make their brains tingle. The question is, can we support, what did Lauren Hill say? Even after all my logic and my theory, I add an MF, so you ignorant, no, you hear me, <laughs> right? So, so the question is, we say we want it, but do we really want it? Will we support it? Will you go and spend your hard earned money and download folks who are talking consciousness raising and wokeness? And look what happens with, with, with Beyonce. Beyonce is doing it now, and then, oh my God, we didn't know you were black, right? <laughs> or, or, or even the greatest artist, uh, the, the most powerful entertainer and globally recognized performer has blowback too. So be prepared, as Meek Bill said, to bear the consequences. A lot of us aren't, but at the same time, we got to support positive, so-called uplifting and intelligent music and television and art and wherever we find it as well. It's on us as consumers too. <laughs> Dr. Scott, um, the, our brother from uh, Howard and Harvard was talking a little bit about stigma. Can you just talk a little bit about that subject? There, there's uh, this stigma uh, of people who are uh, formerly incarcerated, people who are, are coming home, and how our community uh, can go about uplifting mm -hmm. uh, folk. I think the stigma is very real, and I'll just speak from a personal experience. I have cousins who were in and out of the, the system for most of their lives. And the welcome home starts in your home. It starts with forgiving for whatever mistakes they may have made in your own individual homes, and then putting that energy towards second chance programs. Mm. They can't find jobs if you come and apply for a job and the first thing box you check off is that you have a record, right? And so how are you going to give people the skills and the, and the chance and the ability to rehabilitate themselves if you don't have the programs in place that would allow them to do so? Yeah, man, great, great. All right, we're gonna take three more questions and I think that, that, will, that will probably be the end. So if you, if you number 15 in a row, uh, you're probably not gonna get your question in. So. Don't be mad at me, be mad at the time people. Go ahead, sir. My brother, Van Jones. This is Elder Brother Oduno. I don't correct people, I just give them a suggestion. My sisters and my brothers on the diocese. This is the eve of our mother's 102nd birthday. And in New York City, when we talk about music in this country and around the world, just as you did, Dr. Michelle Scott, the tremendous evaluation <laughs> of strange fruit, would you help us in unpacking how through the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community Leagues of our brother, Josiah Ford, 
wrote it will be. the it universal will, it will Ethiopian be. anthem. We're talking about music, and we're talking about the largest formation of Ethiopia, thy land of thy fathers, the land of the gods. Of the I'm asking the question, Dr. Jones. I'm asking the question, Dr. Jones, and we're talking about music, Dr. Jones. As I, as, I did, as I did with everybody else, I just want to restate the question because then we're going to have to get other yes. questions. So just restate your question, then we'll move on. Um, yes, you, sir. You yes, sir. So, so. I mean, let me finish the question mark of the question. Okay, here's my problem. I have a problem with you, Dr. Jones, because you cut off an elder. You cut off an elder. What is the relationship of what is the relationship of the song and how it was written by Josiah on a board when a young girl was raped is there in the blood. Members? Thank you very much, okay. Brother Jones. Right, thank you. An elder is speaking who was asking a question. Thank you. Thank you. So, and actually, a very good question, by the way, just to restate it. Very good question, by the way. Uh, we did not mention uh, uh, Garvey's movie, which is the UN, UNIA, which also brought together economics and culture. So there's, a, there's a, actually a good question. So that's, that's one, one. You good, sir. Thank you. So uh, speaking of artists leveraging their platform for criminal justice reform, can you please take a second to talk about the work that you've done with Prince, Phaedra Ellis Lampkins, and the work she's done with Promise so people can see examples of uh, how executives and artists are coming together to address these issues? Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you very much. Come on, Terrence. Hi, Mimi Kelly, I'm number three, so Terrence is gonna be after me, okay? That's fine, hey, the, the, Mimi elders, Kelly. the, the elders and the young folks are taking over, I mean, I'm not gonna <laughs>
Professor Dyson. Yeah, let me answer the panel question. <laughs> <laughs> you made your comment at a panel. <laughs> and if you made your comment at a panel, the panel permitted you to argue against the panel, paradoxically. Most of the time, Martin Luther King Jr., since he's the paradigmatic expression of revolutionary <laughs> impulse and activity in America. <laughs> What King did for most of his life Man. was talk. Thank you, baby. Now, the talk led to revolutionary resistance to economic injustice, social inequality, and white supremacy. But I, for one, and, and forgive me, my dear sister, because I know you were raising a legitimate point, but allow me to express just a bit of angst and a modicum of anxiety as a public intellectual. I see white folk every day elevating their intellectuals. They're using them to keep you in chains. They are using them to justify your inherent inferiority. They use big words to give you longer sentences predicated upon a narrow conception of your humanity. And when finally our black intellectuals come along, we ain't trying to hear that shit.
She's so beautiful. Where's the mic? The mic. The mic. No. You guys couldn't hear it because she didn't have a microphone. I'm going to give it to her because she might talk too long. Yes, right. Right. So, but here's what I want to say is this. She was actually shedding a tear. Listen now. Because she felt misunderstood. It takes courage to stand up in front of our community and say anything at all. She showed courage. And the worst nightmare is you say something you gonna misunderstood. So then she felt misunderstood. She didn't run out the back. She didn't go on Twitter and start cussing folk out. She moved closer to the community. Now listen, this is, this is teaching. She moved closer to community, closer to engagement, and continued to try to be heard. And then you watch his face change totally. She said, brother, I bought your books and gave them to my sons. Y'all can hear that. There was an exchange here. And this is what happens in our community. Meek and I were just talking about this. We miscommunicate. And then we separate. And then sometimes beef does jump off. This is passion yeah. for change. We heard a beautiful cry for action from you, a beautiful defense of thought from you. I want to now say what I think can happen going forward. Can I address your thing about the deeds? Brother Hakeem Jeffries. Oh, wait. What did you say? What did you say? Oh, no. Nah, uh, earlier, I was talking to Van about just communication. like. And, and in my neighborhood, and in my city, a lot of people die, and a lot of people end up with problems with each other because uh, a lot of us don't really know how to communicate and how to express ourselves. And you know, as I grew and got older, I learned how to express myself. And the move with uh, me and Drake did on stage was just an uh, example just to kill and bring that, that self-hate level down a notch, you know what I'm saying? Because in our neighborhoods, a lot of young men, it's a lot of black on black violence where most of the stuff is just because of miscommunication. If that was in the streets right there, he, she would have had a problem with him, he would have had a problem with him, and you know, that would have went on for a period of time, and uh, violence probably could have took place, but you stepped up and you communicated, and you know, we come to a, a uh, a better understanding, and yes, sir. Awesome. you know, I think communication is a, a, a big thing that need to be addressed in our community. So look, so look, this is real. See, the Congressional Black Caucus ain't no normal conference. If you don't, if it's your first time coming, come back. Cause this is this is family. This is ministry. This is church. This is partying. This is the Congressional Black Caucus. This is how we do. Okay, yeah. okay, you know what I mean? Not one minute of this thing. This is how black folk do. So this is all real. This is happening in real time. But what I want to say is this. And I, I know y'all just think I'm a fanatic, but I have been watching this man work. And if you want to know how to make something positive happen, Support what Hakeem Jeffries is doing. He's yes. actually doing real stuff. And we love to say, yeah, no, I'm brother. But then do we go onto his social media and sign up? Do we go onto his website and sign up? Do we contribute to his campaign and his effort so he can be strong and independent? You know, a lot of times we focus on our not-for-profits. I run not-for-profits. But guess what? The, by definition, not-for-profit can never, ever endorse a candidate. So we put a lot of our effort for people who cannot, when the vote comes, do the right thing. So one thing I would just say moving out here is make sure you sign up and support Hakeem Jeffries. Number two, just to get to one of the questions. My brother asked me about Prince. And 
the great work that he did. And how he taught those of us in his camp to think and to move and to maneuver. Because he didn't have somebody like you, sir, in the music industry when he was fighting Warner Brothers. And when Warner Brothers was trying to crush him. And people thought that he was crazy when he said, I'm changing my name to a symbol. Mm -hmm. Our community didn't understand that was a part of a, of a brilliant corporate legal strategy. Because when he was a 17-year-old, he signed a contract that said that they owned There's his name. name. And he said, my mother named me Prince Rogers Nelson. You tell me a corporation can take the name my mother gave me and tell me if I put out a record with Prince on it, you own it, you own me, I'm a slave? I'm a slave, you tell me? Well, then I'll put out a, a record with a name on it you can't even pronounce it, go on without my business. And you can call me the artist formerly known as Prince, but you don't own nobody who's black. That's what he was doing, and we missed the whole story. We missed the whole drama. It was a war between Prince and the music industry over are we slaves or not in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. And those of us who were blessed to be around him and to support him and to help him, we learned that so much of the genius in our community, the value of it gets taken by the lawyers, by the labels, by the managers, by the accountants, now by the technologists. And Prince saw that coming, and he put us in motion. Uh, Phaedra Ellis Lampkins is now running a technology company, comes out of the Prince camp. And her technology company is designed to try to dismantle the criminal justice incarceration industry. She's using technology to, <clears throat> to fight that. I come out of the Prince camp, and you see what I'm trying to do supporting real leadership. There's a whole lot that goes on behind the scenes that I feel like we need to reveal more. Yeah. These brothers go through, and sisters, go through hell fighting this industry. And we want them to do more. I believe we're now entering an age, and I'll move on to the last question because we gotta go. But I believe we're entering an age where I hope that the commercial equation flips. That only artists like me get our support. That only people who are willing to use our dollars and use our attention and use our clicks and use our lights to advance our cause get our support. So it's no longer, well, I would support you, but I'm gonna lose my money. I would support you, but you're gonna uh, take my, uh, uh, say, lynch my bank account. Uh, Prince proved when he walked away from that whole thing that our artists can go ahead and be global superstars anyway. So thank, thank you for putting Prince Rogers Nelson back in the conversation. I appreciate you for doing that. Prince, thank you, Prince. But last question I wanna close with. I'm gonna skip your ageism question because we spent a lot of time with you. Uh, well, that's all right. Oh, that's all right. Um, me. You got three words written there on that piece of paper. And I'm looking over your shoulder. Yeah, that's just a habit. Yeah. And I see you, it's, it's almost like you're encouraging greatness for all of us. You are the only person up here who's actually spent time behind bars, the only person up here right now under the scrutiny of the court system and yet you're continuing to speak out in every way possible. Either those words or any other words to anybody, especially these young people. I just want the, the, this community to get a chance to hear from you as you go out and continue your fight for justice. Uh, I would say like me, uh, I got some of my uh, ambition and inspiration from Tupac. Uh, you know, a lot of people, Tupac, of course he wasn't an angel himself, he had his own ways, but uh, the things I seen him go through uh, coming up, uh, through through the television, the way I seen it, and through the music industry. But his journeys he traveled through just inspired me to keep uh, going more, no matter what I go through. Uh, I've been through a lot of things in my life. I know a lot of people in this building probably been through a lot of things in their life. And you know me, uh, I always just say, keep pushing, because six months ago, uh, I was locked in the cell 24 hours a day. You know, you're a celebrity, they take you away from out of population and put you in a cage for 24 hours a day, which is terrible, by the way. Nobody ever explains that part, being locked in the closet 24 hours a day and shackled from uh, wrist to ankle. Uh, 
when I was in that position, I never thought about really giving up. You know, where we come from, we come from actually having nothing. And if, if it's anybody in that position where you think about giving up, just always push forward and dream big because I always used to tell people back 10 years ago, you could have had Martin Luther King come to my neighborhood and be like, dream big, you can be what you want to be. From the things we saw, we saw so much failure, we didn't even believe in believing. So, you know, just if you don't believe, dream big because I'm the, I'm an example of you can make it through anything. I just had a two to four year sentence and now I'm sitting on a panel with brilliant men and women like this and, and speaking in front of people like you and actually sharing my story for a better uh, cause. So, you know, I would say dream big.